All right, so I'm assuming you've already created a custom dungeon and we're going to transform your data pack so that it can be used on any world or server. So open your world folder that contains your custom dungeon, go to generated, Minecraft, and then we're gonna copy this folder structures. We'll head back out to the main folder, go to data packs and go all the way through until you can see the world gen folder that contains your template pool. We'll paste the structures folder in here and then we need to modify the template pool accordingly. You'll need to open up all of your template pool files and then go to where it says location and you need to change the Minecraft colon to be the namespace of your data pack. And you need to do that for every single piece. So now before we go any further, we need to test and see if it worked. So we're gonna make a new world where you'll place your data pack, which I assume you know how to do by this point. We're going to use slash place jigsaw, the name of your pool, whatever your start pool is called. Mine's just Talon Pool. Make sure you put your connector name. Mine's just Minecraft walk side. Set the depth, set where it's gonna spawn. We'll just put it right under me. And this will test whether or not the jigsaw has correctly been updated to work in a new world. So. Now that we've tested it can work, we can move on. If you have any issues at this point, you need to go back and debug that template pool file. So now we can get into the world gen stuff. So make sure to back out of the world. And I'm gonna show you something that you'll probably be doing a lot when you're testing uh, world gen stuff. So select these three folders, region, point of interest, and entities, and we're gonna delete them. <laughs> if the entities one doesn't des uh, delete, you can just go inside and delete all the files manually. And now we're going to make the new files that we're going to be working with. So go all the way into world gen. We're going to make a new folder called structure, not structures, structure. And then we're going to make another folder called structure underscore set. And then we're going to put an empty JSON file in each of these, just like that. And we're going to be working with the one in the structure folder first. Now, this name is actually very important. We're going to rename it. And this is going to be the structure ID, which gets used in like the locate command, for example. I'm just gonna call mine color maze, and then we're gonna open it up. So we'll start with the easiest stuff first. So the first key is start pool. So you surround that in quotes, put a colon, and then we're going to put the name of our jigsaw template pool structure. That was the same one we used in the place command. So for me, it's gonna be talon pool. Now, a lot of this stuff that we're going to be talking about, you can pretty much just copy and paste, but I highly recommend taking the time to understand what it means because that will be a lot more valuable for you in the long run. So this next option here, this is start jigsaw name. This is optional. You don't need to include it but it's the same as that, uh, that second option in the place command. So you can specify a connector. This is really useful if you wanna start from like a specific room or if you wanna start from a specific direction. Next option is size, another super easy one. We're just gonna specify, this can go all the way up to 20, which we're just gonna do because it's gonna make it huge. <laughs> You can also use Mysode, which I'll put a link in the description to generate these files. Just make sure that you spend the time to understand what each of these options do. That's the primary goal here. So this one is probably the first one that we're gonna have to like think a little bit about. These other uh, options here were pretty easy, but this max distance from center defines how far away the jigsaws can generate. So if you put it at a low number like 10, you'll notice uh, it restricts the dungeon and makes it a lot smaller in size because the jigsaws can only be 10 blocks away from the starting point. So usually you're gonna want this to be big. Um, you can put it up to 116. Technically it can go beyond that, but it requires more, more reasoning like with other settings and stuff. So for ease of uh, understanding, just think of it as being capped at 116. By the way, setting these two to max can cause quite a bit of generation lag. Just for reference, villages use um, six and 80, like that. But just so you know how high up you can go to, I'll leave these numbers here. So now we're gonna move on to start height. That is the height that the jigsaw block will start at when it generates. And this first option is called project start to height map. 
Now this has some very specific options. Um, one of which is World Surface WG, which stands for World Generation. There's technically also a version that's like this, but if you look at the differences here, this is WG and this is regular. Like, I can't see any difference between them. So might as well use the World Generation version. Um, makes a little more sense. Your other options are Ocean Floor, which also has a WG and non-WG version. Um, ocean floor is pretty significant as you can see. Um, it's important you set terrain adaption to none, which we'll get to that in a little bit if you want this one to work. But probably the main two you're going to be using are ocean floor or world surface. Making sure that these are all capital, by the way. There are two more options. There's motion blocking and then motion blocking no leaves. But they don't make much of a difference in terms of world generation. So we're just going to roll with world surface world gen. Now setting the start height to be like world surface or ocean floor or whatever, it's technically optional. You don't need to set project start to height map. Um, but the reason we started with it is because this second option start height is relative to it. Now start height is like way, way, way more uh, intuitive. So you can just like set uh, an absolute height. For example, you could just do zero. And this will be zero blocks relative to the project start to height map if it exists. So basically it's like zero plus world surface. And then if we delete this line, it's just zero, like y equals zero. Now you actually have a lot of control over the start height. Um, so beyond just setting it to like be zero, you could set it to be between two numbers. So this is what I used in my let's play. It's a uniformly random distribution between 20 blocks below the top of the world and 20 blocks above the top of the world. So basically it just like randomly sticks it somewhere in between um, that spot, which works really well for a space dimension, which is what I made. But this is where the MySode uh, generator is super useful. You can just mess around with all the different types and stuff. And I'm not really going to go into it because most of them are pretty intuitive. So we'll just roll with absolute zero for now relative to the project project start to height map. Okay, so things start picking up here. Um, we have two sort of just, you have to have them commands or keys, sorry. So there's use expansion hack, which is not as cool as it sounds. Um, only villages use this and they set it to true and everything else just has to set it to false. Has to be there. If it's not there, you're gonna get errors. The next one that needs to not be changed is the type one. This defines the whole type of structure that we're making, which is a jigsaw. So you just set that to type a jigsaw. And that unlocks four really important and powerful commands. So the first one here is biomes. So this is how you can specify which biomes you want your structure to spawn in. And you can make it so that it only spawns in those relevant structures. So there's two ways to do it. One is by using this hashtag, and then you specify a biome tag. Uh, I'll put a list of biome tags in the description. And one super easy biome tag is Minecraft colon is overworld. So anything in the overworld will uh, be able to spawn our start pool. The other way you can specify biomes is a lot more finer grained control. So you make a, a list by putting two square brackets and then you just specify a biome. So like you could do Minecraft planes and then maybe Minecraft deep ocean. That's really not a great combo, but I mean, you get the point, right? Yeah, and obviously these can be uh, custom as well. So if you had a dimension, like I have a Talon space dimension and there's a biome in it called just space, not space, space. <laughs> So um, you can specify custom dimensions and custom biomes in here. Super, super cool. There's a lot of control you get just with this one key and value. And don't worry if you don't know which biomes are named what. All you got to do is open up F3 and take a look over here at the biome thing and you can see Minecraft colon forest and that's what you slap into your file. Now this next one makes a pretty big difference too. You'll really want to think about this one. This, that's uh, terrain adaptation. So this is another one where we have preset options. We have none, beard thin, this will all make sense in a moment, beard box, and berry. Now I'll show you the differences between these. 
So if we pull up a bunch of them, you can see one of the biggest, biggest differences is none has no terrain underneath the structure. So if it extends out past where normal terrain is, it doesn't care. <laughs> it won't put anything there. All the other three put stuff underneath the, uh, the jigsaw as far out as it goes. In fact, that's Beard Thin's main purpose. And the way I like to think of it is like the jigsaw has sort of a beard of terrain underneath it, right? <laughs> Going all the way around. Now, if we take a look from another angle, you can see the upside to using Beard Box or Burry. So you can see that Barry is like, it really, really like puts everything underground. It like pretty much tries to hide it. And this is actually used by stronghold generation in the game. It works very well if you put your start height underneath world surface. So like at cave level or whatever. Beard box, on the other hand, is used by ancient cities. And it, may, it pretty much puts a box of air not like a perfect square box, but like a box of air around your structure. And it gives it a little bit of wiggle room in that way. So it sort of makes a, a beard of land below and then a beard of air above, kind of, if you want to think of it like that. So you can see they each have pretty important uh, terrain interactions. And this is probably something you'll want to mess with and, and try out multiple options here. It's a, it's a pretty big thing. For us, I'm going to do Beard Thin, since that's a pretty good generalized one. Now, this next one has potential to be crazy in theory, but it's not actually as awesome <laughs> in practice. So this defines the generation step that the jigsaw structure is going to get summoned in. So you can just set this to surface structures and move on if you want. There's also a couple other, uh, I'll call them valid options, which is underground structures and then strongholds. Technically, you can put any generation step in here, like you could start with uh, step one, raw generation, but it doesn't have a, a huge effect. Same with the last step, top layer modification. So my guess is in certain niche scenarios, these might actually affect your generation, but for most of the time, you probably can just roll with surface structures and call it a day. But this last option, you didn't know you needed this last option. Well, maybe you did. This one is called Spawn Overrides. Not overriders, overrides. And this lets you define entities that you want to spawn in the bounding box of your jigsaw. Now there's multiple categories for this key here. So you, it could be like monster, creature, ambient. It, it just depends on what kind of thing you're trying to spawn. And what's cooler is you can add multiple of these. So you could have a monster one and an ambient for like, I don't know, a squid or something. We'll just work with one right now. So we'll start with the easy stuff. Bounding box. This just defines the bounding box that these things can spawn in. So you can either do piece or full. Full makes a big giant bounding box over the whole thing and piece only takes the individual bounding boxes of each jigsaw room. So generally speaking, the more square your dungeon is, the better full is going to look. So think Ocean Monument. And the more funky <laughs> your, your uh, dungeon is, the more peace is going to look better. So think uh, Nether Fortress. So then we'll open up our spawns list here. And this is a list of all of the things that fit the category that you stated above here. So we could have type phantom, skeleton, endermite, all in this same spawns list. Um, so for this one, we're just going to do one entity for simplicity. So we're going to do a ravager. That'll be a pretty interesting spawn, I think. Okay, so then what we do is we specify a min count and a max count here. And what's important is that this min count cannot be zero. It, it has to be more. So the lowest you can go is one because it has to also be an integer. Um, and then you can't have it be more than max count, duh. You know, so you can't put a six there. It won't like that. You could set them both the same and like force basically pack spawns. So you like five and five. Um, for us, I think we'll do one and five, so we'll get some pretty good variety. 
And then our last option here is weight. And this is an integer as well. And the larger you set the number, um, the more likely something is to spawn. So we're just going to set ours to mm, four. Sure. Excellent. OK, so that is the first file explained. And I hope you understood these parts. You'll get an opportunity to trial and error a lot of them as soon as we make the second file. So make sure you save this file. Make sure you remember the name of the file because we'll need that for our second one. So mine is called colormaze.json. So in your world gen folder, go to the structure set folder and we're going to rename this to be something that makes a little more sense. I'm just going to call mine the name of the other one plus rarity. So we'll open this up in our editor. And the first thing we're going to do is define the structures that this rarity affects. And don't worry, this rarity is going to be a lot shorter than that other file. We've done the bulk of the work already. So we'll do square brackets, curly brackets, and then we do structure. And we'll put the name of the file that we just finished making. Um, but don't forget to put your namespace of your data pack in front of it. We'll also define a weight here. Um, if you don't have any other structures here, you can just set it to one. If you want to add more structures, you can put a comma and then just repeat the process. So then outside of the square brackets, we're going to put in our placement key. And this is going to define the rarity. So we'll start with the simplest command. Uh, or the simplest key, which is salt. And I cannot really explain this number to you very well beyond saying, I believe it, it functions very similarly to a seed. So just set it to some non-negative integer. And then we can move on to a little bit more interesting of one. Frequency, this is a big one. This must be a number between zero and one. And it can be a float so you can, you know, do all your nonsense. This is just how frequently it's going to try and uh, follow all those rules that we just set in the other file and try and place it. So the lower this number is, the less of a chance you're going to get one. If you put it at one, your world is going to be full of these things. <laughs> and there's a decent chance if you have a big one, it's going to leg out your world. So I would put it, you know, maybe at 0.3 or so. OK, we're going to skim over a couple of keys here because they're not really that meaningful. So there's one frequency reduction method. There's also locate offset. Yeah, so we're gonna skip those two and we're gonna kind of skim the third one, exclusion zone. So this lets you tell the game, don't put my structure by this other set. But unless you really, really need this exclusion zone, I don't recommend including it because I noticed that it increased the generation time. Also, it didn't seem to be one to one with the, the chunk count. So for our last little section, we have two options. We can either do concentric rings, which gives us a few other options to use, or we can do random spread. So this is very much an either or scenario. And random spread is way easier to use. Um, if you want to do concentric rings, go check out Mysode. It's used for strongholds, basically, but it's more complex. So we're just going to use the one that you're probably going to be using 99% of the time. And there's two very simple options that, oh my goodness, I can't spell, that go with this one. So there's separation, and this is the minimum distance in chunks. It's an integer, so we could do... 43. It's the minimum distance in chunks that you can have between your structures. Technically, it's like it's in between attempts. So theoretically, you could have it try and fail at both locations because of this uh, frequency thing. If this was one, then uh, they would succeed all the time minus uh, biome restrictions and other things like that. But yeah, so this is the minimum distance in chunks. So we will go with the village number there, which is eight for separation. And our final option here is also very important, but very simple. It's spacing and it is the average distance in chunks between generation attempts or basically between your dungeons. Villages have a value of 32, but they're also limited to biomes. So depending on like where your thing can spawn, you can mess with this a lot. And these rarity numbers, frequency, separation, spacing, 
you'll probably be changing these a lot and fine tuning them. But these are pretty good numbers to use. So we'll save that. And now we have both files that we needed to generate the actual dungeon, the custom dungeon in our world. And remember, we made a data pack. That means we could slap it onto any world, any server, whatever we wanted. But now is the moment of truth. Let's load into our world and see. Oh yeah, this is a normal thing. Anything with world gen, this will pop up. We say, I know what I'm doing, and it generates. Depending on your settings, the generation speed here will get affected pretty significantly. Bigger dungeons and more complex rules will require more generation time. But this is so cool because once you load in, you can find it using locate slash locate structure and you just say your structure ID. That's the file name of the first thing we made. And it'll check. It takes a little bit of time sometimes. Again, the, the generation speed, which is kind of what's happening right now, the generation speed will vary based on your settings. Whoa, <laughs> there we go. All right, the nearest maze is at these locations. Click on the thing, you press enter, you can teleport to your structure. I have my, <laughs> I have my structure generation settings on max, so <laughs> we get huge dungeons and very <laughs> slow generation times. Yeah, look at the size of this thing. Oh my word, <laughs> you can see it's, uh, it's slowing down quite a bit. So now all you have to do is delete the chunks change the settings and experiment. Just keep iterating through it until you have something you like. But that is going to be it for me. I hope you guys enjoyed this tutorial. I hope it was useful for you. <laughs> There's a lot of lag still. <laughs> Definitely turning down the, uh, the size and the max distance from center will, uh, will fix that if you're experiencing the same issues. But that is going to be it for me. So I'll catch you guys in the next one. Later, later.